Hello and welcome to Business Without Bullshit. I am Andy Uri and alongside me is my co-host and father, Richard Uri. How are you doing? I'm okay. Good Fantastic. to see you. Fantastic. And today we are joined by a very special guest whose work we highly admire, Martin Wolf, um, Chief Economics Commentator at the Financial Times. Welcome to the podcast. Pleased be, to be with you, at least at the moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, Martin, we, we always like to ask a, a, just a simple first question. Um, what, what's keeping you up at night at the moment? Well, I think, to be honest, there are so many things. On the, uh, the day-to-day uh, life, what I write about and what's going on in the world are the same things, so they keep me awake for both reasons professional yeah, wow. and personal we've been through a pandemic we uh, are in the middle of a very serious war we have a fantastic turmoil as a result in commodity prices and a major energy crisis and cost of living crisis in europe which will i think um, affect political stability and you can see it in some ways even in this country with this wave of strikes i don't know how this will end which sort of reminds me a bit of the 70s. So from a professional point of view and a personal point of view, you have to ask, how will this end? And I know enough to know that it'll probably end well. Mostly they do, but sometimes they don't. Yeah, there was um, certainly an, a, an optimistic time, time within that. I mean, my, my dad made me laugh a while ago when we were talking about you know, for us, it just seems so bad at the moment. And then you kind of did a potted history in your head. And you said, well, hang on, it's always been an absolute nightmare. And you just sort of ran through the last however many Well, there's decades. always wars and 1974 and all of that and the chaos that ensued. and It's worked its way through. Yes, I think, well, there there is a, first, it's true. Most of the time it works its way through. Second, um, you, you might be talking about well, where England or Britain is now, mm. the Britain is very favourably positioned to oh, work it? its way through because yep. it's an island and the yeah. uh, and uh, an island with strong allies. Very nice position to be in. Um, and uh, but my parents were both refugees, so uh, fortunately none of this has affected me directly. But I know when things can end up very differently, and one cannot take it for granted that they won't. I, the, it's the uh, the splendid isolation point, isn't it? That the, the, the UK's fortunate position. There's a sort of time zone one, but as you say, you know, we've got a moat, as, 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 as there, the famous a, phrase goes. It was goes. a wonderful letter, which I remember. I think it was in the Times, because um, somebody had written the, the an article about the blessings of Britain. This is quite a long time ago. Mm. Nothing to do with Brexit or any of that. And uh, there was a response to the letter, of quite a short one, from a Polish gentleman who who said, you know, when I think about it, there's only one thing that about Britain we, we really envy, and that's the English Channel. Yeah, yeah. And, and with the, uh, we weren't invaded, what, by Napoleon, by, you know, and, 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 and we'd love to put it down to our fabulous military, and we're not bad in a fight, but it's well, I water think the, that stopped them. The Navy was pretty important, and we built it up for very good reasons, and indeed the history of... of uh, British public finance is really linked to financing the Navy, uh, something that's not widely understood. But the, um, and they were really good. Uh, but the big thing that the, the, the British could do is they could put all their resources into the Navy. The Army was by continental standards for a country of this size quite trivial. Yeah. And they didn't need it because they first had to get through the Navy and the Navy could do this because the sea was big enough to d- defend it. Now, in earlier periods, like 1066, there wasn't a navy, or at least it wasn't consistently successful enough. Alfred the Great actually did build one, but very important. But the point is defending Britain before you get on the land, before anybody gets massacred, all the rest of it, has consistently proved pretty easy because for a very long time, with the partial exception of the 17th century with the Dutch, they control the seas. But now, you know, in today's age of sort of everything's digital and everything, is that that moat economically is still fundamental to how we'll, we'll be all right, Jack, kind of thing? Well, I think that it is perfectly arguable that this instinctive belief, this inherited belief of uh, English, particularly because I think Scots and Welsh view of history is somewhat different, mm. important to remember. Mm. But anyway, England or Britain, that... And we are an island and we are secure as an island is no longer as 
plausible as it used to be. First, the air, air, there's the air, and now there's space. Uh, that's just a military point of view. Um, having the English Channel doesn't defend you against an intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missile very well. And then, of course, um, our economy is deeply integrated into the world's economy. Uh, and in, I think people don't understand how profound the implications of that are compared with, say, 80 years ago or 70 years ago, when we at least were self-sufficient in manufacturers. We could produce pretty well everything we needed from that point of view. We imported food, which was important, and, uh, and later raw materials, oil and so forth. But if you controlled the seas, which they did throughout the, the two wars with American help, crucially, um, then you were secure. But now, if you go look at what British people consume, what, um, what we consume, the inputs for our industrial processes we need, a vast proportion of them come from abroad, and we don't know how to make them. No. And I think this affected the Brexit campaign. People didn't understand that these perfectly understandable historical instincts, reflexes, uh, coming from the Napoleonic Wars, you mentioned the First World War, the Second World War, and so forth, don't really work in the same way. It's different now. So we remain, I think, uh, benef we benefit from the channel in some important ways. It is difficult for a land army to get here, but our vulnerabilities to the world are much deeper than I think many people realise. But out of this, you know, what is fortunate or unfortunate about our position? You're sort of saying we, you're, you're optimistic about how things will pan out um, in terms of, you know, maybe we're at the bottom of a load of problems, are we? Or Well, if it, this is, we're, we're just talking about the broad historical context. Mm. So if I was going to list what we, the assets we have and the problems we have, the asset we have is this is a rich country still. Yeah which is important to remember this, we have very considerable resources which we can use. Um, we have, by world standards, a pretty sophisticated population, highly educated, with some first-rate educational institutions. Mm -hmm. um, we have a fair number of businesses that function well and produce things in very different kinds, which the world wants. We have um, a, a major position in the world's dominant language, so we have these great assets. The problems we have is we are very substantially deindustrialized, and I don't think that can be reversed. Um, that has left a large part of our country that affected the regions very profoundly and a large part of our population, I think, somewhat economically bereft. It has made our economy quite unbalanced and... It, um, it, there's a real question, I think, about what our new growth drivers are going to be. Mm. Um, what are the sectors? You, you know, one of the views I have is what you can do really well tomorrow depends on what you can do really well today. You mm. can't just jump into something no. new. And so one of the things I worry about is that there aren't that many things we do very well today which are going to allow us to do very well tomorrow. There are some... Life sciences, obviously, some of the high tech, some of the finance, some of the creative industries. These are really strong yeah. media. Unfortunately, these are good things. Yeah. But fortunately, if you look at them, they employ highly skilled, highly creative, mostly university educated people. Um, and that's the basis of our comparative advantage. So it, the question then arises, well, what, what, what are these, the growth of these industries going to mean? For the population as a whole and for the economy as a whole i should have added universities and education science and those mm. things into it this is a, a growth opportunity for highly creative individuals many of whom are highly educated not all and highly skilled and that's very different from what happened within industrialization which was much more though very painful much more inclusive yeah, you, you hit too on something that bothers me. Someone described it to me years ago, calling about this, talked to me about the social Darwinism of London. And he said, you know, the problem with these cities is you, you have to be cleverer, higher educated, to, you know, be able to afford to live there. They're moving at this rapid rate. They're open. They're, you know, they're, they're a different society. And it's leaving the rest of the country apart. And but this is it. I don't know how we fix it. It well, just seems to be getting worse. Britain, 
I've uh, written a bit about this. I hadn't realised this before I'd written about it, but ours is um, basically the most regionally unequal economy in Europe. And this is the main reason. Well, part of the reason, London is really rich. Yeah. I mean, the average income, the actual income distribution in London is extremely wide. So there are lots of poor people in London. Um, very important to remember. But on average, London is extremely rich because it is a focus of all these things I've talked about. Mm. And if you sort of include London, the southeast, so you throw in Oxford and Cambridge and it's yeah, a nexus of high productivity, highly skilled, often global people, international people, uh, doing highly paid and skilled things. And people, and these are, this is an agglomeration. The pe- people come here because there are other people like them and businesses that know how to use them. Um, this gives uh, London a, a dynamism, which has been pretty consistent even now. And how do you start this? Elsewhere, yeah. it's, it's very interesting. And again, I hadn't realized that if you look at our other large cities, they don't show any of the economies of scale that big cities show elsewhere. In general, big cities in the modern world are richer than uh, the countryside, the country around. The average incomes are higher because they generate huge agglomeration economies, as a technical term. But this doesn't seem to apply strangely to a Manchester um, or a Birmingham. They've fallen behind as their as their manufacturing. Have they? I wasn't aware. You... And and so one of the big things that has to be done is to reverse that. I think there are things we can do, but uh, and, and that was what the levelling up so called white paper was about. That wasn't a, in any way a, a perfect document. But we have to recognise that's going to be a lengthy and quite costly and difficult process, which involves, in my view, political transformation, investing in infrastructure, investing in heavily in research institutions, universities, and things like that, um, creating an environment in which skilled people will want to live, beginning to create these agglomerations. Because, again, London is sucked in from... But so like many the, of the skilled people in in our society, the graduates leave the top universities, then they go to London, and that's really very difficult for everywhere else. Yeah, it's, it's such a dominant force. Well, it's hard to move gravity, isn't it? I mean, I'm looking at around us in the Thames Valley, a lot of film studios developing, growing, planning permission being granted. Pinewood, yeah. but they all want it. Well, not just Pinewood. I mean, Amazon got a bit, took over Bray Studios and developed it. There's another one being in the in for planning within a mile of that. So there's a sort of growth of these studios because they want to be together because it is the agglomeration of the skilled technicians and the people. And trying to say to them, well, you've got to go and move to Newcastle. Uh, which is a lovely place to live and, you know, be quite happy to move somewhere like that. But, you know, they're not going to go because the, the labour's no. there. He throws also a problem in my book because it, if you're an international executive, it's got the most flights, you want to come yeah, there. Of course. And, th- and then you'll have your business, you know, Amazon or whoever it is, will be, want to be there. So it's hard to move the gravity, isn't it, to actually... I think in, to some degree it's going to be impossible but i think we can make it a little uh, somewhat uh, less bad or somewhat uh, better with some uh, effort but the fundamental truth is this is a huge and very wealthy agglomeration by world standards certainly by european standards um, it's a megalopolis and uh, sort of include everywhere about 15 million people about a quarter of the population much more of the economy it's very very difficult to reverse and in a way it would be crazy to try and reverse it if it meant actually destroying yeah, yeah. the one powerful economic engine that the UK has. So British governments have a problem, but at the same time, you have to recognise that a large part of the population correspondingly does feel left behind, and that shows up in the politics, and you want a stable society. You want people to feel they all have an opportunity, that their children have an opportunity. And so we have to do both. What's so frustrating, and you 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 allude to it several times. This, this we all aware of this short sightedness. You know, I mean, it just seems mad. You feel like the Germans know. You know, you always talk about how the Germans rebuilt the industry and everything, and it's just like, why can't a politician stand up and say, right, I've got a twenty year plan. We're gonna because we seem to be able to pull money out the air these days when we need it. You know, we can borrow two hundred billion. Why can't we do 
you know, we're going to rebuild our infrastructure. It's going to cost. It's going to cost us a trillion pounds, and it will take twenty years, and off we go. You know, there are two different. There are three different questions here. First, why are politics so short termist? I think this is because politicians are pretty. Politicians respond to incentives, and politicians don't think they will be rewarded for not being short termist. Mm. Um, and that's because. That's not the way the electorate thinks. So we're never uh, being given a choice to think otherwise. Though, well, are we? the well, let's get to the second thing. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing is politicians do what they think works, um, s slogans and so forth. The second is to do this properly requires really an enormous amount of um, far sighted policy making and thinking which can't be just done by politicians because there are very few of them and they don't know. So this needs uh, um, this capacity in the, the bureaucracy and associated research institutions. They have to be integrated. And the, the bureaucracy, which I think is actually rather capable, is driven by the politics. So most of the effort... I think almost overwhelmingly the effort of the British government is managing the short term because that's what the politics says to them they should be doing. So that then drives the sort of, if you like, ask, take the most important department, the HM Treasury. It's basically concerned about short term stability because that's what people really respond to. And uh, its long term planning capacity is very, very, very limited. And that's true of most of the other departments of state. Um, just asking the questions that the levelling up white paper asked was an extraordinarily rare activity for the British government, its machine, the whole system, because it's not asked those sorts of questions. Universities, by the way, for different reasons, all their research departments are also not very helpful because they're mostly quite theoretical in economics. There's no real reward for, mm. for working on... Um, on uh, these things. And the final point is I don't think our institutions of government are very ideally suited to it because ultimately everything is centralised in London. So the, and all the power and all the choices. So there isn't a stream of powerful, well-argued cases coming, or there haven't been arguments being made for a different way of looking at this. Um, so we are stuck, I think, in a in a in a vicious circle of relatively short term politics, which drives, which supports the reinforcement of current strengths, because today's situation is what everybody focuses on. I would finally just say on your comment, well. I think there is an interesting question about how best to use our resources. Um, I think we can, we could invest more, um, and I've been arguing for a long time we could borrow, have borrowed more. Though it's now getting much more difficult to make that argument at the moment. But the, it's still a matter of choices. Resources aren't infinite, and so you have to decide. Well, what do you want to spend money on? Yeah. Do you feel that maybe that whole levelling up, you know, maybe Scottish independence would be good, maybe London and the South East should form their own, I know that's the same sort of, you know, thing, but maybe they need to be separate little countries because little countries can run themselves better. And I think there's lots of evidence that little, some of the richest and happiest countries in the world, if you look at the, yeah. the wealth, uh, happiness of the population are small countries. Um, Finland, yeah. and Denmark, all the Scandies. <laughs> Switzerland, Switzerland. Um, all the Scandies, yes, uh, yeah. uh, the Netherlands. These are pretty successful places. So uh, now there are two arguments against this. Uh, one, obviously, is this all works because actually there's somebody big underwriting their security. That's not us, it's the Americans, obviously. Um, but the, the, the deeper answer is there is no way of getting there from here except in the Scottish case. I think there is a perfectly plausible long-run case for Scottish independence. The intermediate 20 or 30 years will be really hard. You can, I mean, not as hard as they were in Ireland, because that was a different context and a different background, but they were very... It took Ireland basically 60 years, 60 to 70 to years... To stabilise the country. To, to, 
No, to, well, no, they stabilized it earlier, but to work out a growth model that really, really worked for them. Yeah. And, and in the meantime, they remained, for most of that period, very poor and rather isolated. Um, now, Scotland wouldn't go through that, but the redesign of the Scottish economy, the Scottish economic system, and all that that would be required by independence would be radical. And in the short run, their welfare state would have to be pretty savagely cut back, I think. If, I don't think they could fund it very easily because they are a pretty weak economy. They could argue that that's because they've been part of the union for so long, but that's the situation. Now, breaking up the rest of the country is historically just impossible. This is, you know, England is arguably the strongest and oldest unitary state in Europe. Um, really, the really? Strong, strongest and oldest. Because Germany's quite yeah. new. Oh, the, Germany know. and Italy obviously know we're in it. Fra and even France. France, it took France really till the end of the Middle Ages because it's vastly bigger and um, to actually impose a powerful centralised state. Then they had religious wars. So the really strong centralised state of France is a sort of 17th century creation. But um, you can argue that England was essentially created as a unitary state um, by Alfred and his successors. Mm. So um, in by the 10th century, yeah. it already existed. William the Conqueror maybe be reinforced it. But essentially, this is a 1100-year-old unitary state. All the really strong regional identities, you remember, there was Wessex and Mercia and Northumbria have disappeared. Uh, the, this is a unitary state, and people think of themselves as English. I don't think there's any, no, I, any plausible model. I did once write a column, which I thought was great fun, saying you know, that London should secede and become a city-state, um, and that it would, of course, be fantastically prosperous, and it would be a totally different place from what it is now. But it's obviously a jeu d'esprit. It's not serious. So we have to do with England what we can. But England, nonetheless, is extraordinarily centralised by the standards of a country of this size. It's a, it's a, you know, England is what fifty million plus. Yeah, the exact figures. It's a big country by European standards. There are only um, a, a few. France, uh, Italy, just Germany, which are bigger. And um, everything is decided in London. There's yeah. no reason why we shouldn't have created alternative structures. The, the problem is our historical structures, which were counties, are not really economically relevant. You need structures which compare in size with the, the German lender. That is to say that they are viable city regions. And you'd probably, if you were designing it, but this is not the way we work, you'd probably break England up into six biggish regions and give them very substantial powers, and that would generate competition among them. The central government would, of course, redistribute resources but would not be deciding how they spent money. Some would succeed, some would fail, and they'd learn from one another. I think this will be great fun to do yes. this, and I think it will be the results <coughs> might be very productive, and I just can't see it happening because... It would mean that the whole machinery in London, would all of it, the politics would the lose gift. power, would lose power <laughs> uh, and control. And the public, by the way, would react against this because they, what they would say is, well, as a result of this, these people over in hey, Newcastle are doing much better than we are and wherever we are. And that's not acceptable. I mean, we want, we want, uh, we're, we're all the same. This is called postcode let lottery or whatever it might be. Yeah. So... Creating a different and generally decentralised system of governance will be resisted. It's been resisted by the Conservatives and by Labour, and I. It's like a curse and a, and a, and a blessing. Well, isn't if you're it? talking about the weaknesses of where we are, I think this over centralisation of British public life and its short termism in thinking about policy, getting it to think long term about policy is really striking. I'll give one example, which I engage in. When this trust and Kwasi Kwarteng came in, they said, our aim is growth. And by the way, I think pretty well everybody agrees with that, yeah. right? But then they said, well, what is, what is a growth strategy? Essentially, their view of a growth strategy is cut marginal tax rate, not by very much, by the way, 
and deregulate in areas which really have nothing to do with growth. The aim and the means that they were putting forward had no relationship with one another. Um, the as We've done basically as much as we can do with that sort of reform in the Thatcher period. That's the argument I made. We now have to focus on the areas you focus on, what sort of inf investment we want to make, in what sort of investments do we want to make, what sort of institutions do we need to create, mm. what is the basis of our future comparative advantage. There's a work being going on organized by the Resolution Foundation on that, which is very important. How do you build on what we're good at and yet make sure that it does actually affect most of the regions of our country? These are really difficult questions which require organized institutionalized policy making and we're really bad at that and that's where i mean most people are but as we've discussed also with france in the post-war period but certainly why do you think we're bad at it though i mean well we're because, quite open in you know we're not because, bad at politics because but no we're very bad good at politics but our orientation is what well, a man called duncan weldon wrote this very good book i thought called muddling through and that's what we do. Uh, we don't like this long-term planning idea, and uh, and our orientations are quite short-term. I think one of the reasons for that is it worked so well for so long. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the simple truth is we muddled through into the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, yeah. We muddled through into creating the biggest empire in world history. Nobody planned it. It just happened as a result of the entrepreneurs. You know, that's what they say as engineers. The, en the British are great engineers, but it's all trial and error. We well, don't plan anything. There's we a just, lot, of, just... lot of... And by the way, trial and error is very important. And muddling through into great success is very important too. I'm not suggesting everything can be planned. Yeah. Uh, not at all. I'm not... That's naive. But this process of serendipity, market freedom, entrepreneurialism serendipity adjusting to the moment and then if that doesn't work adjusting again is very much british political and economic culture it has very real strengths but i think in our current circumstances it also has weaknesses it makes it very difficult for us to shift into another path and so we've been stuck with the things we turned out to be good at and some of them are, as for the instance finance finance is very important but we over relied on it and it's not going to do again what it did before 2008 it's just mm. not and so we should have said that's not where we're going to go let's build on something else i mean one of the things that i do respect about dominic cummings um who was in many ways a slightly strange human being yeah. is that he said well what are one of the things we are we're genuinely scientifically innovative yeah um now let's see if we can create institutions, our DARPA, which will actually generate real economic activity out of that. Well, we can do more than we've done. It's an old problem. I think we can do more than we can. And it's not even planning. You need institutions to do that. You need institutions that link up with local, with uh, governments around the country which are interested in it, getting people to talk to one another. That's basically a lot of what how Germany has done things. Um, uh, the I don't think muddling through is enough anymore. We are individualists wrapped up within a highly centralized short-termist political system. That's I think basically yeah, what we are, disagree. and we and we are have been effective muddlers through, and we will continue to be. I'm not. I don't. I think this it's will go on. For so it long. will go on. It will go on, and it won't fundamentally change because that's who we are, and it gives us some real strengths, and and it gives us things in our society which I really enjoy, like the individualism. Yeah, yeah. Um, we don't go completely crazy like the Yanks, but then on the other we hand, have unarmed police, the, but we know? don't, on the other hand, create their uh, spectacularly successful, big innovative no. companies. We create small innovative companies. Some of the issues, are, I sort of don't know what your view would be, but I'd, the abolition basically of technical colleges seems to me a bit of a disaster because I've got clients who are manufacturing, but they can't get any skilled labour. They invest heavily in automation, but they still need people who can build quality products. And uh, there just doesn't seem to be any labour out there. And there's, so how you develop those businesses when they've got 
world beating products and can't get any labour that's you know very little labour is a really tricky issue. Well, my wife is the expert on skills and she's been trying to persuade the British government to spend much more on this and to and to uh, create with uh, with industry apprenticeships and so forth which would really work. I mean, as she says, uh, the biggest problem is that um, uh, if there's a shortage of money in the government, which there was for education, schools get it first and universities get it second. And that leaves anything else, further education, technical education and so forth, out in the wilderness. So she has proposed some very interesting reforms which might make a big difference over time, a lifetime learning allowance and so forth, um, but the, but the this is this has become the sort of stepchild of our of our expenditure, and uh, um, as the budgets get tighter and tighter, it becomes increasingly difficult for governments to invest in things like that. The until we left the EU, the solution for many companies was to bring in skilled people uh, from Europe. Now more globally, but it's I think always difficult to get exactly what you need if you're looking in a labour market thousands and thousands of miles away. So I agree with you. We've obviously done a poor job. It's a long-standing complaint. It goes back to the 19th century, actually, in creating the skilled people we need. It's a, it's a vicious circle, though. It's exactly what we're talking about. It's the critical mass problem. The industry disappears. How do you train Then you them? can't train them. And then people aren't used to those sorts of jobs. Uh, the, the, I deal the with university the, uh, colleges are offering criminology and media yeah. studies, some of which is fine, but leaving a huge gap for the skilled machinists or whatever that's needed. That well, I mean, when we brought in the Japanese companies, Nissan and Toyota and Honda and people like that in the 1980s, one of the the reason for doing this was to uh, to get them to train people, and they did. I mean, it was a small thing, but it was a significant thing. It was one of the... Th- Reverse uh, of history there. You know, yeah, 100 yeah, years yeah, earlier, we yeah, were out there. Absolutely, but realistic, and they did. Uh, but, uh, well, first, of course, I don't think that sort of thing is going to work so well now that we're not in the EU. Um, the, the, some of them will stay, but they're not going to invest as they would have otherwise, I believe. I can't prove that yet. Um, but the the bigger problem, then I agree with you completely. Who are the people who would hire these? Who are the companies? Um, of course, Rolls-Royce has a superb uh, apprenticeship program. Mm. I've seen it. BAE must do so too, though I haven't. But there aren't many of these employers, and if they disappear then the demand for the labour they would have had disappears and therefore they won't be um, motivating people to acquire these skills. It's a vicious circle. Losing as much of our industrial base over such a long period, and by the way, it goes back a very long time. The the, the firms that died in the 80s were often way b- outmoded yeah, way already. Um well, you explained M- it when the Commonwealth sort yes, of fell apart. Yes. Yeah, we Where you, yeah, we used to sell to the... That was a mistake because it was bound... The imperial preference was bound to end. But the um, my former editor, Jeff Owen, wrote a wonderful book. And his basic argument was that after the war was the time to... The, the, the time when you had to go open. It was a great tragedy. We didn't join the common market at the beginning, in which case we wouldn't have had this additional 20 years of protected... Commonwealth-based oh, sort of export, uh, export uh, orientation in protected markets, essentially within the imperial system, that disappeared. Then, when we joined the EU uh, or the EC, as it then was, German industry, which had become above all, but also some others, so globally competitive because it had to after the war and had been cheap and it built up these huge globally oriented companies, VW and so forth, they were just so far in advance of our manufacturing companies and then the Japanese came along that it was no longer possible to um, for them to survive. And then in machine, machine tools was even worse. It was really collapsed almost completely. Um, and all the engineering industries associated with it. And the, the argument was that the... The walled garden of the of the imperial preference com- Commonwealth preference system basically was a trap for British industry, and 
Uh, I think if you read his book on this, uh, it's pretty persuasive. Anyway, this is ancient history. I mean, we can't redo 70 years ago. But where we are now is um, that that's not our strength. There are a few firms that are very, very strong, uh, and we hope they will continue to be successful. But... uh, um, we're not going to replicate that. Yeah, you wonder and if this so we go. So we have to go somewhere else. And I yeah. suggested we've got lots of areas where we can Media. go. Kill it. And, and uh, I mean, that where we should, in principle, be able to succeed, we can create lots of new companies. I think in tech, we're quite successful in that. Then what we've got to do, and this is not my area of expertise, is find ways of nurturing them to real scale. And the, the question is, what market do they serve, and how do they? Operate. They don't have the American market. They don't have the European market. It's They're the funding. Have and to I go it. for the global. The, the, the Americans can always bring more money. And yeah, the well, company they, that wins the, is often the that, best. Funding. That is. A, they have, and because they have a really fantastically developed venture capital system. So if you're talking about restructuring our financial industry, I mean, the there's a well-known complaint about British banking and British finance and the British stock market that it is doing a very, very bad bad job of developing and supporting new firms in new industries. It's a, it's a complaint that goes back um, to the 20s. And, oh, wow. and uh, I think it's true. Yeah, uh, I'm the, sure the, it's true. The, the, so um, it, you know, the British government currently is very, very interested in what can we do with finance. Well, I have other views on this. I mean, we've created, we've reorganized our pension funds. Well, they've killed them, but we've reorganized them essentially in such a way that nearly all their investments are in British government bonds. I mean, that's crazy. Why would mm. you want long-term funds? They're no longer long-term. In fact, they're mostly closing. But you don't want long-term funds to focus on existing firms, and you certainly don't want them to buy government bonds. You want part of what they do to because it would be good for them and the country, to invest in the new things. And our financial industry really makes it very difficult. I mean, you know, w- within all of this, so, the, you know, yes, we need to focus on the things we're strong at, I guess. I guess there's a sort of a romance to let's rebuild, let's be British industry again. Maybe that passed. Maybe now, if you look at what we're really good at, like you mentioned it, music, we're absolutely killer at music or media. You know, we, but we, you know when it comes to creative pursuits, we're like, we're so much better than the competition. You know, it's New York, really, you know, or, you know, live other places that compete. So maybe be less romantic and move forward and be who we are. You know, does it matter if we just produce creative stuff? Well, you know? I think at the very least, we should take the greatest possible advantage we can of what we are good at. Yeah. And creative industry is certainly one of them. Mm. As I said, scientific research, we remain remarkably leading. We have some of the best universities in the world. Uh, we have the language. Um, we do have finance, and uh, there are activities there which are built on things we're really good at, um, legal system and so forth. But I don't think it's going to be enough. So I think the uh, I do think life science, bio, uh, yeah. biotechnology, is going to be a huge growth sector. We have some real strength there, historically created, and. Um, there may be all be things spun out of university research which will turn to be very significant. But I agree with you completely that re- resurrecting the industry we've lost is very implausible. And in any case, um, the, the deindustrialization process has meant that everywhere, even though industry does generate a lot of income, it's, it employs a declining proportion of the labor force, absolutely everywhere. So if we want to create attractive employment opportunities for people in this country. Industry is now 10% of the labour force. It's not going to rise. It is important, but it's not the future. I mean, if I may end on on this, 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 talking about the UK, we must end on weather. I mean, the weird thing is, is the weather's weather. We, we're so fortunate in our weather. You know, I, I think we're great inventors and things like this, just because there's no hurricanes, there's no this, there's no that. You know, we end up in the shed, just you know, fixing stuff or you know, getting things um, organized, as it were. It's um, a livable climate, without yeah. a doubt. 
I mean, there are a few other advantages. We don't have earthquakes. Yeah, no which earthquakes. Are, uh, which you compare us with Japan in that regard. With the for Middle example, East of water, I uh, got recently. We, we have an Lots awful... We are not likely to run out of water as long as the Gulf Stream continues to operate. Our weather is remarkably benign. Yes. Uh, though it feels, doesn't feel so benign today. It could yes, be rather too quite. cold. Uh, the... Uh, so it's a very habitable place, though not if you want a sunny holiday. No. Uh, the that's not the problem, and it's a state. We're coming back to where we started. It's a stable society. The political system basically works. We don't have the violence or the extremism you can see in some important countries. Um, all this is pretty good. Um, I think people are beginning to realise that the sort of spasm of Brexit doesn't solve many problems. Um, the, but I think the problem, the worry I have is we're becoming economically stagnant. Our living standards are not rising. A lot of our politics and distributional struggles as a result, they make it increasingly difficult to do anything. Yeah. And politics becomes increasingly defensive and conservative. So if you look at the what are the plans, the programs of our political parties for a better future? They're remarkably similar. Yeah, There's they're no, incredibly similar. And, I know, I'm liberal and now. Ba and basically, <laughs> they're the re remarkably similar. And what they're basically saying, when you really look at it, we can't do anything. Yeah, it's true. And, I mean, just look at the budgets. Look at what they're spending on. Look at what they're... What they're saying is, we can't do anything. That sort of defeatism is ultimately self-defeating. Yeah, 100%. Can I ask you a question, which is completely off the subject of work, <laughs> but um, how reliable do you think the statistics that we're getting on? I know statistics and damn statistics, but the rate of speed of change, I think the last time the government looked at it was about seven years ago, of you know what they should do. But the rate of change in the seven years to write a report now, probably in two years' time, would be completely out of date. So how do you get reliable information as an economist where they're leaving chunks out of the numbers, as far as I understand it, the way we've changed to deliver and all the rest of it is not properly in the numbers? Well, I think it's... So there, there are so many different questions wrapped up in that. Uh, the um, First, of course... Getting reliable numbers, aggregate numbers for an economy is very, very difficult. In some ways, it's got easier because everything's, all transactions are digital, so you can record more things, and there are more means. I mean, the um, Googles and so forth actually give you a lot of data, and you can get data out of them. We know things, for example, during the, just to give you an example, during the COVID pandemic, we knew about the footfalls of people, where they were going uh, in sort of real time in a way we could never have known before. So there are areas in which uh, our data have clearly massively improved and could improve much further if we use these technologies. And I've, I've been talking to people in the past in the major companies in, in America about this potential for improved data. That's the first point. So I wouldn't despair using that Second, of course, because things change radically, getting index numbers over time to compare well is very, very hard because the baskets of goods in them change so radically. And the, that's a big conceptual and practical issue, and there are no perfect numbers. The third point I would make is there is a tendency, and this is counterintuitive so you might well push against this there is a tendency to believe that ours is the fa period of fastest change in history but i think this is quite wrong uh in some ways this would involve a long argument i think the economic change in our time is slower than it has been in in the past particularly in the late 19th and for and 20th centuries um there have always been completely new products which change everything um, just think what electricity did. And just, it's just unimaginable Trains. how much it changed. Trains before that. So this, this problem of having unrecorded value, which is real, um, not measuring change accurately in, and therefore not having a real sense 
of what's going on is uh, not a new one, and we, and in many ways, the numbers we do now are much better. What I do think is problematic is that in our case now, most of the technological change is linked with information and communication technology, and a lot of the value that they generate is clearly is not uh, is not accounted for. So Google in the national accounts is an advertising company. That's what they get their revenue from, and we can record it as an as an as an advertising company. In terms of the, it provides a very large amount of free services for those for, uh, in return for this, the income it gets from advertising, but they're genuinely free, like GPS um, maps and all the rest of it. And putting the, those zero price services into a national income, so it's really, really hard. Does any of that affect the the measures we have for productivity in our economy? I think, and people have looked at this very carefully, the answer is probably not much. Um, but there are always questions about how well we can actually evaluate what's going on. But I would stress there are some areas where we know much more and other areas where the difficulties are familiar. They're, they're old, deep problems. But there are some areas where, where we're getting now this wave of basically cheap services or zero-cost services. That's quite difficult. I always feel sorry for the FT graph, whoever has to do the graph, the, the three-dimensional representations, because there's always there's not just one thing of data, there's always three. I mean, partic particularly your articles will have... Uh, you know, there's representation. So there's, there's, it's like, how do you get across this, like, super complicated layer? Well, we, I mean, I'm much worse at it than my colleagues, but I think we have re really great experts at presentation of data. It's very All difficult. presentations of data are difficult, but you need to know quite a lot about them. I, you know, when I was at Oxford, I spent time, quite a lot of time on statistics. So yeah. the, uh, the presentation of data is something people have thought about for going back to the 19th century, mostly here in this country, actually. Obviously, a graph can lie. You have to be reasonably honest, uh, and there are problems with them. But I, I, I insist that some data are better than none. I'm an old-fashioned, enlightenment-type person, and facts are facts. They can be debated. How factual they are uh, to be discussed, of course. But m more data is better than less data, and if you've got an argument about data, let's get better data. But uh, you can't just make things up. I really feel passionately that in a civilized democratic society, we can disagree about values. We can disagree about interpretation of data, of course. We can ask for more data, but we can't have arguments in which data don't exist. Yeah. And you, you indicated there for you it's sort of a, a couple of years ahead, but maybe this fits with the muddling through. Maybe muddling through isn't a bad thing because you have imperfect data. Oh, yeah. You, you just sort of, it, it's a, you know, it's like you say, as a whole, we kind of get a sense of it. So, you know, we can kind of feel what we're doing. But, you know, if you focus well, in too much. My response to this is you need both. Um, you make a plan. Uh, you sort of work out where you want to go. And then things turn out to change from what you expected and you change the plan. What's yeah. the problem with that? That's no. what any sensible business would do. Uh, you know, businesses, well worked out business, have intentions of where they want to go. They they or they don't just decide oh, on fundamental. what they do tomorrow. They decide on several years. And then if it turns out that what they thought was going to work is a complete disaster, then at some point they cut their losses and would do something else. So this is... In a world of uncertainty, you can never have a plan you stick to. That's mm. nuts. It's almost in inconceivable that will work. On the other hand, having no plan at all, you know, this is, this is I think, Tim uh, Geiger um, made this point, um, former US Treasury Secretary. Um, plan beats no plan. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> plan beats no plan. But uh, fixed sticking absolutely rigorously and rigidly to a plan which doesn't work anymore is almost equally nuts. Uh, you, if it doesn't work, you change it.
A lot of the best businesses I know, especially in an earlier stage, they, they the ability of the CEO to sort of pivot and understand yeah. what hmm. matters and doesn't matter, and and maybe find something out that they're like it might kill their whole original idea, and they just yeah. shift, and it's yeah. like, of course, you know, uh, off of we course. Go. I mean, to give an example, which is very remarkable, I think, in recent business history, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos created an online retailing operation, yeah, and as far as, as, far as I can see, the most important function of amazon now is cloud services yeah, yeah that wasn't planned they were developed as a byproduct of this activity I'm sure his and they suddenly realized supplies. because they decided well we better do this for ourselves and they decided realized my god this is a fantastic asset by the way the same has happened with microsoft yeah so these are in many ways not the businesses that were founded businesses where well, there are a few exceptions like banking which is always in some sense the same business so in that changes but businesses that go on for a long time have to seize, particularly in dynamic sectors of the economy like tech, ha have to change what they do. So Apple was created as a personal computer business. Mm. There's still a personal computer business there. I use them. But that's not the, the business it's in now. It's not even clear that it's really in the making of mobile phones. It's the, all the services attached to them. Mm. So, uh, again, for the country... You, I'm not suggesting you should have a rigorous national plan. That would be completely crazy. But there are, if you're going to build serious infrastructure, for example, that takes a, a decade or so. So you have to have a plan to do it. Um, would I have gone for HS2? No, probably not. But the, um, if you want to build a lot more houses, actually you need some changes in planning rules. And to do that, you have to have a plan to how you're going to change them. There's no other way you can do serious policy. That's a big problem in our country. You can't build anything, uh, or it's very difficult to do so. So, as I say, a plan beats no plan, but rigid, rigid planning is also nuts. And so a bit of muddling through, but not just muddling through.